Hello, everyone. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Um, I want to thank everyone who's joining us today. And before we get started, I have a few announcements as folks continue to join. Uh, first, we are recording this session and it will be available in Whova, our conference app, within two weeks after the Congress ends. If you'd like to ask our speakers a question during the session, please use the Q&A area to the right of your screen. The chat window is also there and you can engage with other attendees as well. We kindly ask that you keep your microphones and cameras off during the presentations and follow the presenter's lead on when to engage with cameras and microphones on. It looks like we're ready to get started, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our first speaker, Luke. Welcome, Luke. Tanya, hi everyone. Thanks for coming along. Just going to get my screen ready. Okay, great. Let's go. Welcome everyone to our uh, symposium on actions for sustaining biodiversity in, in fire prone ecosystems. I'm, I'm really excited about today. I've been looking forward to it for a very long time. So I'm joining you guys today from Australia and in Australia, it's customary to start meetings like this by recognizing our traditional owners. So I just like to say that I'm speaking today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and I acknowledge them as traditional owners and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and also to Indigenous elders from other communities that might be joining us here today. If you guys um, would like to acknowledge Indigenous elders from other parts of the world, from where you are, um, please use some of the chat functions uh, in Hoover to do so. So speaking of the Wondery people, the photo to the left here is a, is a good example of a, a cultural burn that's been done by them in Australia. And here you can see some cockatoos feeding on this post-fire regeneration. And I think it's a good way to start is by thinking about fire actually as a good thing. The right kind of fire can be very good for biodiversity. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about some of the ways that fire regime can actually be detrimental to biodiversity. But let's keep in mind the, the critical role of fire um, in sustaining healthy ecosystems as well. So I think the photo of the cockatoos shows that. Also the photo of this, this little pine seedling coming up in the Mediterranean basin after fire. So this session is going to be led by me, Hegel Johan and Bob Keane. Uh, and we have an exciting list of speakers um, from different parts of the world, and I'll introduce them in a bit more detail soon. So what I wanna do in this opening presentation is, is set the scene, and I wanna do four things. I wanna set the context for biodiversity change around the world, in particular, fire-related extinction risk. I wanna talk about some of the drivers of these changes, and I think that sets the context then for the emerging actions and strategies that all the speakers are going to talk about today. And I'm going to end just to get you thinking about a few challenges and opportunities in relation to some of these actions and strategies. You can see a, a beautiful picture of uh, um, Rosenberg's goanna uh, hanging on in a post-fire environment in Australia. I quite like global maps and I think this is a good way to start because it shows the fire really is a global phenomena. This is just a snapshot of fire activity from 2000 to 2019. These dark colors just represent different fire frequencies uh, at the scale of this map. And you can see lots of dark areas, particularly around savannah ecosystems in Australia, Africa, Cerrado in South America, and especially, um, and also in you know, parts of Eurasia and grasslands as well. The take on from this is simply that, you know, fire is something that influences ecosystems right around the world. And it's also something that can bring us together. But fire regimes are changing um, in different parts. There's different things going on in different parts of the world as well. In some areas, we're getting more frequent high intensity fires. In other areas, fire is actually being excluded and ecosystems aren't getting enough of the right kind of fire. But different aspects of the fire regime can change, whether it's fire season, fire size, fire frequency, and so on. That has implications for biodiversity. So last year, my, uh, with 26 amazing colleagues, I, I published this paper about fire and biodiversity in the Anthropocene. And as part of this, we reviewed the 29,000 species or so that are listed as threatened by the IUCN in their red list. Um, and what we did find kind of shocked us. It was that for 4,400 of those threatened species, changes in fire regime actually threaten those species or contribute to their um, risk of extinction. That's quite a lot, 4,400 species. And I'll just take you through this graph um, from the paper. So this is for some of the better studied groups like gymnosperms and birds 
and this shows the proportion or the percentage of those species that are threatened and how many of them are threatened by fire. So right at the top, you can see about 28% of gymnosperms that are threatened are threatened by changes in fire regimes. And we find this across a whole bunch of different taxa from freshwater fish to dragonflies to the gymnosperms and also in lots of different ecosystems as well. Sometimes it's good just to think about single species as well as these big global data sets. So I just want to give you two examples of, of some interesting plants. This is a, a pine that's endemic to Tasmania in the south of Australia. And this pine's threatened by too much fire. It's hanging on in some little refuges, but after colonization by Europeans in Australia, this species has declined a lot. Some of you might be familiar with this species. This is white bark pine in, in North America. This is another species where it's declined in part because of pathogens and things like mountain beetles, but also because of changes in fire regimes. So it's not just fires are changing, it's um, the changes in fire and link changes in biodiversity uh, interacting with lots of other processes. This is another figure from the science paper. And this is just a snapshot of different kinds of species or ecosystems, aspects of biodiversity that are changing around the world. And these things that interact with fire can be grouped in different ways. So we could think about grouping them like global climate change or land use change, biotic mixing, for example, invasive species. And all of these changes are underpinned by socioeconomic changes as well. So they all interact. So I'm gonna give you four just very quick examples to walk you through these kinds of changes. This cute little fella here is a, a lead beater's possum. This is an arboreal species from Australia lives in tall forests, really likes big trees, and it nests in hollows that only occur in really old, old trees. But logging and wildfires have removed those large trees and climate change has exacerbated this. So the climate in this case makes the fuels drier uh, and we get bigger fires. It also changes weather patterns, which lead to more extreme fires in Australia. When we get forests that end up looking like this, that burn two or three times in quick succession, and it knocks out the habitat for this species. It's a good example of fire and climate and land use all interacting. Well, bad examples, depending on how you look at it. This handsome devil here is a greater sage grouse. This is an example where invasive plants can come in and change fire regimes and, and harm a species. In this case, this is a species that occurs in deserts and shrublands in the United States, but an invasive grass called cheatgrass has increased fuel loads and the continuity of those fuels, and that's changed fire regimes. Um, and potentially, if there's more frequent and more frequent high intensity fire in particular, linked to cheatgrass, that can take away habitat for this species, which likes foraging in dense vegetation. It's not always too much fire though. In some ecosystems, they're not getting enough fire. And uh, the Serengeti Ma is a good example of that in Tasmania and in Tanzania. Um, here we have a, a, reduced, a reduction in fuel um, and that's associated with livestock grazing in this part of the world and the particular way that livestock transforms these ecosystems. And perhaps counterintuitively, the livestock grazing actually leads to shrub encroachment in this system. As you can see by this, this photo below taken by Sally Archibald, um, you can see it gets denser and that can harm you know, species like zebras and wildebeest, which prefer to forage in, in more open areas. It's a nice photo here of the zebras doing pretty well in recently burnt vegetation. So some ecosystems aren't getting enough fire. So we've talked about examples from, from land use, climate, invasive species, but a lot of these changes are underpinned by big, big picture socioeconomic drivers, sometimes called indirect drivers. And this is a good example, a Dartford warbler from, this is the species in Spain. It's a threatened open country species. So it likes open spaces and, and it does pretty well in farmland that's in good condition. What's happened in Spain over the last century or so is that people have abandoned some of the smaller villages. So small sort of mosaics of farmland and open forest have been converted to dense forest, which is more fire prone. And often that involves areas dominated by oaks um, being overtaken by more flammable pinus species. And this high tree cover is good for some species, um, but not so good for other species like the Dartford warbler. So there's a role here for um, perhaps for wildfires to, to open up the landscape a little bit for this species. But the take home here is that these, these changes 
in the landscape are underpinned by socioeconomic changes. In this case, people move into the cities um, due to industrialization and for work. So these different changes set the context for the strategies and actions we're gonna be talking about today. Yes, we're talking about fire, but we're also talking about fire in the context of global climate change, which can change you know, the behavior of fires, the fuels that drive fires, and even change ignitions. In Australia, we're starting to see more big pyrocumulonimbus events. And these events can be so extreme that they can generate their own fires and we actually get lightning storms created by these. We also have land use changes, whether it's deforestation fires or small agricultural fires or changes in indigenous ownership and use of the landscape or even urbanization. There are lots of changes going on in that front. We have different kinds of biotic mixing. I've talked about plant invasions, but another kind of mixing or, or disruption is when species go extinct and that can change ecosystems markedly. And again, these are all influenced by people. So I think there's a few take homes just from this, this little bit is that, you know, I started by emphasizing that 4,400 species threatened by fire and people are contributing to that, but we're also a big part of, I think what can be the solution because people can actually use fire pretty well or uh, implement different actions that can benefit all of these species. So people, so we're a big part of this, I think, and a big part of the solution. And that's what I'm excited to talk about in this session today with all these amazing speakers. This is just showing the two sessions, the session today with four speakers following me and a session tomorrow with five speakers, um, talking about many different actions and strategies that I'm excited about. From Sophie's gonna start talking about restoration of wetlands. Tim Curran's gonna be talking about green fire breaks, low flammability fuels. We're gonna hear about managed wildfire from Gabrielle in watersheds. And today, Chris Dickman's gonna be talking to us about artificial shelters in deserts in Australia and many more tomorrow. So throughout this, I'm interested as well in, in what the audience thinks, because we're gonna have a, a fire circle at the end of these sessions. And um, so these is, this is a, almost like a starting list of really exciting actions. And I'm interested in actions that people are implementing in other parts of the world as well. Perhaps some that are really thinking outside the box. So I wanna finish this presentation. I've got, looking at my watch, I've got four and a half minutes left, three and a half minutes left. I wanna just flag three sort of challenges and opportunities. I don't wanna to think too far ahead because I wanna hear what the speakers have to say, but I, I, I thought I'd flag this so that we have something to, to think on, to ponder, to mull over while we're listening to all these talks. I think one thing that is challenging is thinking about what we're actually trying to achieve. Different countries, different regions have different ways of thinking about biodiversity and ecosystems. Different people have different views about what a healthy ecosystem is or what aspects of biodiversity they really care about. Are we, are we trying to recreate things from the past, historical ecosystems, or are we trying to create new or, or novel ecosystems that benefit people and biodiversity in different ways? There's some big questions there. Um, and I think this is important because the kinds of actions that we implement, for them to be effective, we need to have very clear objectives and we need to know how to achieve them. So I think there's lots of fascinating stuff here. I've shown a picture of rhinos because they're a good example where restoration of rhinos in Africa uh, has helped to moderate fire regimes in some places by moderating fuel. And mis mischievously, perhaps some people in Australia even suggested introducing some big animals like this or elephants in areas where we have invasive grasses. So I'm not sure how serious they were about that, but there's big, big things to think through here. The second challenge is thinking about what works when and where. I know most of these actions we're talking about today and other actions like fire suppression uh, and fuel reduction burning are quite controversial almost wherever they occur and are implemented. And in part, it's because some things work better um, in different places or in different contexts. So one I'm sure we're gonna hear about in these sessions of fire suppression, which gets a pretty bad rap and I can understand that. Um, but I thought I'd just show a good example of fire suppression um, this is a well of my pine in Australia. It's a species with links all the way back to Gondwana. It's endangered. There's 200 individuals left and they occur in a single valley. But in Australia, we lost about 10 million hectares in fires in, well, we had about 10 million hectares burnt in wildfires in 2020, which threatened the, the entire population of this um, species. But what people did was send in a, a crack team of, of firefighters and park rangers who, who pumped water, 
and put out fires and targeted suppression for this species. So that's actually a good example of suppression um, benefiting biodiversity. But in other cases, of course, suppression can have perverse outcomes. So what's to think through there? How can we come to, how can we, how can we learn about and test these different actions in a way that's, that's sensible, especially in the context of, um, of science getting criticized more broadly? I know that's something that's happening in Australia a lot and the US and Europe too, and I'm sure in other parts of the world. And finally, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, what partners and, and policy, what partnerships and policies are actually needed to implement these, these actions. And actually that's, that's often, I'm sure you guys will know, it's often a very fun part of doing fire science is working with, with lots of different people with different ideas. So below, this is an example that I took um, from actually the last fire Congress, which was in Tucson, Arizona. And I traveled down to the Mexico US border and um, with a small group, we met with um, people from, from Mexico and on the US who were managing these border, this border country together. Um, and in this case, they're trialing restoring wildfire regimes. So essentially letting fires go under the right conditions. And I thought that was a really nice example of a partnership, a transnational partnership um, with, a, with clear fire management objectives. In this case, it's good for some local biodiversity. So I want us, everyone to keep thinking about not only the actions, but how do we implement them and who should we implement them with to get the right kind of fire or to, to create other strategies. So I'm right on 15 minutes. Um, I'm gonna leave it there. And I just want to say, um, again, I'm really excited about this, this uh, symposium. We have speakers from around the world, from the south in New Zealand, all the way to the boreal forests in Canada. Um, and I think it's going to be fun and really interesting. So thank you very much, everyone. And I look forward to taking a couple of questions before the next speaker, Sophie. Thank you. And as, as the moderator of the session, I'm gonna just look at my phone and see if any questions have, have come in online. If any speakers have questions for me, feel free to jump in on this Zoom as well. I can start with a question. Awesome. Um, do you have an opinion on whether it's better to manage for um, vegetation and presume that that will help endangered species or uh, sort of specifically target the species? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, it's a big one that I, so I've been working with various government agencies in Australia to, to think through that problem. I think you can do a bit of both, but you don't want to go too far in managing just for say plants or vegetation and think that that's going to look after all the animals. So one example from where I work in, um, in forests in Victoria in Australia is we have something called, um, we, we, we think about what we call vital attributes. So the time it might take a plant to uh, mature and produce seed and the time it might take a plant to senesce. And using those sort of that minimum and sort of maximum of a fire that that species might be able to tolerate. We can sort of figure out what's going to keep that species in the mix. Um, but that managing for that plant species doesn't always then manage for the animals that depend on it. So I showed a picture of a cute little lead beater's possum earlier in the talk. And um, what they rely on is not just the presence of that species, but the presence of 400 year old trees with hollows um, that come from those particular species. So if we just focused on keeping the plants present or absent in the landscape, I think we might miss something. So I think we should always be jumping to, to different taxonomic groups and thinking about, I guess, zooming in and out of the, the big picture and, um, and individual species. Thanks for the question, Sophie. And I think we've got about 30 seconds to your presentation. So if people are watching and have more questions, please add them to Hoover um, and we can keep discussing things as this, um, as this symposium goes. Um, finding my notes. Great. So it's right on 9.20. So I'm going to introduce Sophie's presentation. Um, it's a pleasure to have Sophie here today. She's a postdoctoral research fellow from McMaster University in Canada. I first became aware of Sophie's work because I saw a really cool popular article she wrote about using wetlands to, to combat 
wildfire and, um, and, and climate change. And I thought it was just a fantastic idea. So thanks, uh, Sophie, for coming along today. And on behalf of everyone, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Luke. Okay. So um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. My name is Sophie Wilkinson, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at McMaster University um, in Canada. Um, so today I'm going to present wetlands tipping from fire refugia to fire wicks. Um, and it draws on some of my recent work, which combines ecology, hydrology, and wildfire science um, to better understand, but also manage wetland, and in particular peatland wildfires. Um, that's gonna be my focus today. So before I get started, I'd like to thank Luke and the other organizers of this session. Um, I'm honored to be here and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the week. Um, I'd also like to thank funding agencies involved in this work. So there's Boreal Water Futures, Canada Wildfire, and the Canadian Forestry Service um, who support a lot of this work. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from Hamilton, Southern Ontario, which is the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee First Nations. So here's a, uh, a world map for, um, for Luke. Um, uh, so this is a peatland world map. Um, so if you don't know too much about peatlands, they're a broad category of wetland. And as Luke mentioned, wetlands um, are home to 10% of the endangered species in the world. Um, and here you can see peatlands are um, pretty sp spread globally across um, the globe. They're present on every continent um, apart from Antarctica. So even some down here in um, Australasia. Um, so they cover only 3% of the global land area, but they actually store 30% of all soil carbon. Um, so they've been getting a lot of publicity recently for their potential um, to help mitigate the worst um, effects of climate change. But that also means they, they hold a lot of carbon and could, um, and could really sort of propagate the issue. Um, but they're not just important for their carbon storage, also their biodiversity. So they have very specific hydrological conditions being wetlands with this deep organic soil layer. Um, and it's resulted in quite unique biodiversity in these ecosystems, including a lot of bryophyte species um, and highly adapted species. So uh, here I'm showing sphagnum mosses um, and there's hundreds of species of, of this moss and there are keystone species in northern peatlands, uh, which is where I do the majority of my work. Um, and then the mosses, lichens and vascular plants uh, are critical food sources, also habitat sources uh, for, for many species. So where does fire come into play? Well, in fact, as with uh, lots, of, lots of ecosystems, peatlands have actually um, developed over millennia with fire and they now have a lot of fire adapted and um, or fire resistant species. So peatlands can act as fire refugia, um, and they do this by experiencing low severity fire uh, depicted here with this surface fire just sort of creeping along the surface and um, the vegetation is recovered quickly and their biodiversity is maintained. However, we're increasingly seeing examples of where peatlands experience really high severity fire, um, often measured as their depth of burn. So from the pre-fire surface here, to the post fire surface. Um, and the deeper that depth of burn, the more carbon released, the older the carbon release, but also um, the greater potential for that ecosystem to um, shift to a different state, uh, resulting in the loss of that biodiversity. So with that in mind, the questions that I've centered my talk around today are, what are the tipping points that alter how peatlands experience wildfire and how does climate change affect them? And how can management use this knowledge to mitigate severe burning in and biodiversity loss in peatlands? So I thought this photo was a really good example of fire refugia on the landscape. And it's actually from the Georgian Bay biosphere um, in Ontario, Canada. It's a rock barrens landscape. And you can see here that the, the only life really on this whole landscape are in fact peatlands and um, I conducted a study 
uh, with a colleague, Chantelle Markle, and we found out that actually 80% of critical habitat for at-risk reptiles um, was removed from this landscape during the fire. So that was particularly nesting habitat. And so we measured the different sort of uh, burn severity on the organic soils on this landscape. And what we found was this really um, clear threshold response between refugia and, um, and highly burned areas and with pre-fire peak depth. So here you can see uh, peats shallower than 0.6 meters burn really severely, um, whereas those greater than that um, are, do not burn as severely. And we linked this back to um, hydrological measure of water table drawdown rate, where the shallower peats again here have um, much higher water table drawdown rate and the deeper peats are better able to buffer um, their water table position and they're more resistant to drying, which means they're more resistant to burning, um, which means they, they can maintain that habitat for the species. So thinking about this in terms of climate change, um, increasing air temperatures or increasing the atmospheric water demand. And this graph here shows the increase in vapor pressure deficit over northern regions, which is where a lot of those peatlands um, are located. And so this is uh, RCP 4.5 and 8.5. So you can see some really severe increases here. So of course, this is going to to draw the water table down in those peatlands, um, leaving them more vulnerable to burning. But our research shows that it actually could also initiate um, a runaway feedback of tree growth. So usually the shallow water table in peatlands limits vascular plant growth. But when you draw the water table down, you aerate that peat, you actually promote tree growth, which of course increases transpiration, keeps the water table low, and enables more and more um, above ground biomass um, to accumulate. So what does this mean for peatlands interaction with wildfire? Well, to look at that, we took advantage of a horticultural drainage experiment um, in the boreal plains of Alberta. Um, and this peatland was drained in the 70s and then burned in the Fort McMurray fire in 2016. And in the undrained area, we see a really nice, typical um, low severity fire where 46% of our plots um, actually had negligible depth of burn. In the moderately drained area, uh, still some resistance to fire with 14% having negligible depth of burn, but that, that mean depth of burn is sort of creeping up now to 6.4 centimeters. In the heavily drained, there were no areas that resisted Burn and the average depth of burn was actually almost 37 centimeters. So you can visually see here there's sort of great difference between the, the fire severities. And when we look at that in terms of carbon stock, um, that equates to three, six, and over 50% of the carbon stock, which is not only important for the feedback with global climate change, but also if you think about the seed bank lost and the change in function that comes with exposing mineral soil, like in this heavily drained area. So to try and identify a tipping point around above ground biomass, we actually reconstructed basal diameter um, from the burned trees. And you can see their distributions here. Um, and when we correlated that with depth of burn, we found a strong positive correlation. And presuming uh, that everything above 10% depth of burn is high severity fire, we can actually identify um, a tipping point here at a basal diameter of about seven centimeters. Um, so this is really crucial for fire management as this is a metric that could be measured pre-fire. Um, it could be used to identify areas um, of high priority for proactive management. And this actually took place in a black spruce bog, but um, we presume that sort of very similar relationships um, will occur in, in other ecosystems, especially sort of treed fens and treed swamps, and that will help identify those, those high severity fire risks. But what does this mean for sort of biodiversity moving forward? Um, so we returned to the same peatland two years later to um, assess recovery, and we measured vegetation, ground vegetation cover, and also um, evaporation. 
And what we found was a very similar composition in the undrained and moderately drained um, treatments here with the blue colors um, denoting sphagnum mosses and the, the red colors are feather mosses. And you can see their ground cover composition and their um, contribution to evaporation are, are relatively similar. However, when we move to a heavily drained area, and we have a complete dominance of non-peatland species in this grayscale here. And um, this is actually what the heavily drained area looks like. You can see the, the bare peat, um, a lot of vascular vegetation coming in, a lot of disturbance species. Um, and we also had some invasive species as well. So this suggests to us that the heavily drained system has undergone a complete ecosystem regime shift. And that's going to have terrible implications for both carbon sequestration and biodiversity moving forward. Um, so we really need to mitigate this extreme burn severity if we're going to maintain peatland ecosystems and conserve biodiversity. So this is um, where the wildfire management comes in. And peatlands have typically been excluded from Western wildfire management. Um, at least, um, but we're sort of starting to to realize how important it is now um, to be sort of working with these ecosystems. So I've been working in partnership with the Canadian Forestry Service um, for some time now. We've been working to develop and test management practices for black spruce peatlands, um, and that includes um, a, an experimental fire, which is pictured here. Um, which I have some data from. Um, so we're looking at sort of pre-fire management, but also post-fire restoration. So um, as I mentioned earlier, um, sphagnum moss is a keystone um, species and an ecosystem engineer in these northern peatlands. And you can see here, um, it really stands out as um, sphagnum mosses create these hummocks and they're actually incredibly resistant to fire. So here's not all of these hummocks are this big, but here's, here's a very large hummock for scale just a few hours after that experimental fire. Um, and sphagnum moss greatly reduces the fire severity um, experienced in peatlands. As you can see here, the sphagnum plots burn much, much less than other mosses, in this case, feather moss. And so because this group of mosses are so critical for reducing fire severity, um, sort of kickstarting recovery in the ecosystem. Um, we wanted our management efforts to focus on those as, as well as the tipping points that we've already sort of um, quantified. So what we did was set up a long-term field experiment, pretty large scale, it's six hectares of forestry treatments in a black spruce dominated peatland, and there's varying degrees of tree removal. So we have a control plot here, um, and then we have thinned plots, clear felled and mulched. So we're sort of assessing um, the potential for smoldering combustion. So sort of peak burn severity potential um, in these plots. And also what we wanted to do was see how sphagnum responded to these treatments and if we could promote sphagnum on the landscape, um, since we know that it's so fire resistant and so good for um, ecosystem recovery. So this is an example of the clear fell uh, plot. The surface is still pretty much intact. Um, just to give you an idea of scale, there's my, my field partner, Greg. So what we did to further promote sphagnum was actually to include a compression treatment. Um, previous research and um, other research has shown that compression can, can help promote sphagnum um, because of the increased moisture content compared to some of the later successional mosses. So we conducted a compression treatment and then we assessed the smoldering potential of the near surface moss in each of the four different treatments. So if we just zoom in on the control on the thin here to see compression here denoted by the, the C's, um, we can see that this energy quotient actually is decreased um, in the compressed plots. So it has a reduced smoldering potential, but the critical level is really this one here. Um, and you, as you can see, sphagnum is typically below the one, um, showing its resistance to fire. But compression can actually pull feather moss back into this fire resistant state, which could be um, really beneficial for sort of a proactive management approach to reducing fire severity. When we think about promoting 
uh, sphagnum on the landscape, we want to increase moisture. So this is volumetric water content here. And we see that the compression increases moisture content in both species and in both plots, um, which is you know, really positive for potentially getting these systems into a, a better um, sort of fire resistant state. So I'm going to end with a plug for my favorite moss, um, sphagnum moss, uh, which is inadvertently my Twitter handle as well. Um, and that's to use sphagnum plugs as a novel idea for peatland management and restoration. Um, so these are sort of 10 centimeter discs of peat from a donor peatland, which we transplant into the peat um, either before or after fire. And we're in a pretty preliminary phase with this right now, but um, we've had some really good results. So the sphagnum plugs tend to do pretty well, especially without a lot of competition. However, if you, if you squint here or if you know your mosses, you'll be able to see that the sphagnum's being sort of over, overrun a bit with the feather moss um, here. But what we have seen in some of our treated plots is this complete expansion of sphagnum moss as a sort of carpet. Um, and this is sort of a triple whammy for, for fire management here. So you're increasing the fire resistance of the surface, um, you're sequestering carbon, and you're also creating um, a surface here for peatland species to reestablish on. So we are very pleased with that, and that's sort of a work in progress. So in conclusion, um, sometimes it's, it's not remembered, but peatlands are a very natural part of most fire regimes, and their biodiversity is maintained through low severity fire. We've managed to quantify um, some tipping points to high severity fire, which could be useful for management. And um, we're developing management and restoration techniques to promote low severity fire. Uh, with the aim to reduce regime shifts, carbon loss, and biodiversity loss, um, and generally help peatlands uh, continue to mitigate the worst of global climate change. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sophie. Great presentation. Um, I've, got one question, I've got one question for you from the, the Hoover app, and then I think we might have time for one of the presenters as well if they want to ask your question. Um, but we have a question from uh, Luis Gustavo Goncalves, and he's noticed that um, in the Pantanal in Brazil, there were long lasting fires that lasted about seven months. And he noticed some um, ash that was, that was white and red. And he's wondering, um, you know, this, this kind of coloration, is that something that you notice in your system? And in addition to carbon, what other elements and substances are released um, from fires in peatlands? That's a great question, and I didn't talk. Um, I didn't talk a lot about the ash. I also didn't talk about tropical peatland wildfires, which um, release a lot of carbon and obviously have a lot of biodiversity implications as well, um, especially in in the Panatol. Um, so that ash is actually quite nutrient rich, um, which is a little um, strange for the peatlands because they're typically very nutrient poor ecosystems. Um, so it's a lot of sort of the remnants of the trees and vegetation in the ash, and it typically creates um, a, a nitrogen and phosphorus sort of flush into the ecosystem, which can actually be good to get things restarted. So you typically see the, the a, a nutrient flush. It's pretty it's pretty short lived, but it can kickstart some vascular vegetation recovery which creates some shading and sort of a nicer microclimate, um, which then allows the mosses to recover afterwards once those nutrients have sort of been flushed out of the system a bit. Cool, awesome, great answer. Uh, we're a really, really quick question from one of the speakers, if you want. That's right, we're about to take over to, to oh. Hi, Luke um, and Sophie, wonderful talk. Really quick question. It's the same as someone asked um, in the app, actually. I was interested in the compression treatment. What does, what does this actually involve? Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be speedy. So pretty funny story there as most field work goes. We had all of these ideas about using ATVs and we bought sort of um, 
like lawn rollers, like big barrels that we would fill with, with water or sand. Um, but in most of our, in our peatland sites, the, the trees were just too dense or the stumps were too, were too dense and we, we couldn't get in and around them. So it actually ended up being a, a manual um, person compression. So we had a, a group of um, forest fire, forest rangers um, from the local communities, which was amazing. So we had sort of like 20 kids stomping, stomping around the peatland and we were pretty impressed um, that we got like between five and 12, even sort of 15 centimeters of compression in it. And it seemed to stick around um, over a year or so. So actually, yeah, ended up bringing one, a lot of fun, but two more, more sustainable than we might have thought. Great, thanks Sophie. And thanks again for your presentation. Uh, okay, next up we have Tim Curran. Tim, can you hear us all right? Yes, I can. Thanks, Luke. Awesome. Great. And we've got a, a pre-recorded conversation from Tim. So Tim Curran is our next speaker. Tim's an associate professor at Lincoln University in New Zealand. Several years ago, Tim emailed me with a great idea about green fire breaks. And to be honest, I've been thinking about it ever since and reading Tim's papers ever since. I'm really excited about his talk today on all sorts of things, green fire breaks and low family fuels. And Tim, I'll let you take it from here. I think via your pre-recorded conversation, uh, pre-recorded presentation and then taking questions later. Thanks. You're going to play it from that end? Yep, I'm getting ready to play it right now. So we should Thanks be very much. That. Kia ora koutou. My name is Tim Curran. I'm from Lincoln University in New Zealand, and I'm talking about nature-based solutions for fire suppression, green fire breaks, low flammability foods, and planting fire microrefugia. So destructive wildfires are occurring around the world, including in areas like the Arctic Circle and here in New Zealand, where such severe fires have rarely occurred much in the past. And all of this poses the question, how can we reduce fire impact and conserve biodiversity at the same time? So there was a really excellent contribution to this discussion um, published in Science uh, just last year uh, by Luke Kelly and others. Um, and many thanks to Luke and his team um, for putting together this symposium. Um, so this paper um, identified a range of new and emerging actions by which we could sustain biodiversity in ecosystems that experience fire. And there's two of those that I particularly want to talk about today. The first of those is green fire breaks, uh, which is where low flammability species are planted to reduce fire spread and also to provide habitat and also diversified agricultural systems um, where plantings, um, again, of low flammable species might moderate fire regimes and provide also provide habitats for native species. Also wanted to add to that mix um, fire micro refugia, um, an idea that we've been kicking around for a little while now. And this is where you might use low flammability plants to protect immobile fire sensitive species. Now, collectively, all three of these represent nature-based solutions. Um, so in other words, um, actions where we use nature to resolve socio-environmental problems. So green fire breaks, as mentioned, are strips of low flammability vegetation established at strategic locations across the landscape to reduce fire spread. They do this by slowing or stopping the fire front, extinguishing embers, and also potentially by blocking radiant heat. Now, if they're comprised of native species, um, these green fire breaks um, can also maintain or probably even improve biodiversity values in the landscapes where they're deployed. Now, we've just been recently working through a, a review of the global literature on green fire breaks, and we've realised that they've got quite an old history. Um, so this is work done by Susan Prober and others um, looking at the um, Kala, the fire knowledge of the Nadu Nation in southwestern Australia. Um, and they demonstrated that there was a very good understanding of the comparative flammability of different ecosystems. And that that information was then used to determine where camps um, would be located. So for instance, um, the Nadu Nation would shift the camps away from more highly flammable vegetation during the, uh, the summer fire season into less flammable vegetation. Um, so to avoid um, these intense summer bushfires. 
Um, there's a history of them being used um, elsewhere in the world as well too. Um, in China during the Song Dynasty in 900 AD and um, subsequently, uh, plants with known low flammability were um, planted next to um, structures um, and allowed to grow quite high to protect those structures from fires. Um, and there's also a, a history of using low flammability plants and green fire breaks in a range of other countries throughout the 20th century. In fact, nowadays, um, green fire breaks are widespread globally. They're found on every single vegetative continent and uh, across many different countries, including those um, listed here. Um, they're sometimes known as other, other um, descriptors elsewhere. So these are the green strips that are used um, in the Western US um, in the grassland sagebush um, ecosystems. Now, undoubtedly, China is the world leader at implementing green fire breaks. In 2003, there were 364,000 kilometres that have been planted. And the goal is that by 2025, over half a billion kilometres of green fire breaks will be established across the country, um, as shown here with these green fire breaks through a forestry plantation um, being grown along uh, ridgelines. Now, despite all this widespread use, there's been very little testing of green fire breaks. But one place where there has been some testing is China. Um, and so this is the uh, work comes out of this uh, Chinese language book that we summarised in this journal article. Um, and it's the most intense fire of a series of nine tests that were described there. It's dealing with a 10 metre wide, 20 year old green fire break comprised of a, a low flammability local species, um, up a 40 degree slope. Um, and the fire that was associated with this test uh, got up to flame heights of 15 metres and a fire line intensity of nearly 35,000 kilowatts per metre. Um, so essentially, that's a very intense fire. Um, it represents the highest um, intensity class or class six of the Canadian Forest Fire Behaviour System and the second highest fire severity class, very high of um, southeastern Australia's system. So even these fairly narrow green fire breaks seem to be able to um, stop um, quite intense fires. Further evidence comes from other experiments. Um, so this is work um, being done by Marty Alexander and colleagues um, to look at crown fires through this highly flammable jack pine and black spruce um, uh, canopy. Um, they conducted this test under very extreme fire conditions, got quite a raging crown fire going. Uh, but the interesting thing here is this fire was extinguished um, by the low flammability leafed out trembling aspen. Um, that occurred in that plot. Um, and that sort of reflects the uh, the local reference to this forest type as asbestos forest, uh, showing how it uh, can put out a fire. So turning now to, a, to diversified agricultural systems. And I wanted to talk about a project um, that a few of us have just started this year. We're calling it Fighting Fire with Food, Establishing Crops, Mahinga Kai, which is um, traditional Maori foods, Rongoa, which is traditional Maori medicine, and indigenous plants to reduce fire hazard in an increasingly fire-prone world. Um, and it's being run by me, Lloyd, Azar, and Tom uh, from Lincoln, and Norm Mason from Manaki Fenua Landcare Research. Um, and it's being funded by this Argyle Fund uh, through Lincoln University for Azar's postdoc. So there's been considerable past work, well, some past work done on the flammability of crops. There's this really cool study here on pineapples in Brazil, um, which shows that um, in comparison to other species like uh, the peanuts and these um, uh, pasture legumes, uh, the pineapple had a, a, a significantly uh, lower burn area. So essentially we're extinguishing the fires um, and doing so um, much better than um, the other crops that were tested. There's been work on pastures in Canada. So different mixes of fescue, yarrow and clover um, have been shown to have significantly less um, fire intensity um, than that um, in the control plots that were dominated by grasses like reed and brome grass. Showing that um, uh, purposely prepared mixtures of pastures can also um, reduce um, uh, or serve as green fire breaks. Um, and there's this also recent paper uh, suggesting planting of bananas throughout California. Uh, so this was um, went up on BioArchive uh, just this year. Um, the authors are calling these edible fire buffers. 
um, they used uh, fire modelling to look at this and suggested that with a, a medium or a very large um, buffer, the bananas um, would actually decrease fire line intensity, um, similar to that um, predicted for um, a combination of prescribed fire and mechanical thinning. So showing here how a crop could potentially reduce um, flammability across the landscape. So all of those previous studies um, looked at individual species or maybe a group of pasture species. No one yet has looked at the combination of species across an agricultural um, and agricultural slash natural landscapes. And that's where our Fighting Fire with Food project comes in. And we're going to do this um, with a barbecue, specifically our plant barbecue that we've been using for several years now um, to test the comparative flammability of a wide range of different species. Um, and indeed, our data set now comprises 317 species with over 3,000 samples um, burnt on our barbecue, as demonstrated here by Azar. Um, now, I just want to show you some preliminary results we have from those existing 317 species. So this is a PCA um, showing uh, all seven, 317 species as dots across here. Um, these vectors represent the four different variables of flammability that we measure. Essentially, species to the right of the diagram are more flammable, species to the less, left are less flammable. Um, and superimposed on this is just a few interesting species from the 46 um, species of crops tested uh, by Tanmai Pagadala as part of her um, up, uh, current um, master's project. So fruit trees were among the most uh, flammable um, of the crops that, um, that Tanmai tested, um, and in particular pears. Um, apples were right up there as well too. Um, of the cereal crops that we tested, um, wheat was the, um, the most flammable of those. Um, but when we tested things like wine grapes and vegetables, um, we found that they were mostly um, considerably lower in their flammability. And indeed, some species like potatoes, snow peas and bell peppers were right down um, the very low end of the flammability spectrum. So in other words, they were barely igniting on our, on our plant barbecue. Um, and I guess we're starting to call this now, uh, you know, a, a green fire break summer salad. So we're still in the very early stages of consulting with local iwi um, about the Mahinga Kai Rungawa part of our project. Um, but just here are a few species um, selected medicine and food, traditional food plants. Um, so kao kao, really important species um, for medicine, tamari. Um, incredibly low in flammability. Other important food and medicine plants like karamu and karaka, also quite low. But some important species like manuka or leptospermum um, are at the higher end of um, the flammability spectrum. Okay, so turning now to fire refugia. So fire refugia are landscape elements that are unburned or have largely been left unburned uh, post-fire. And they're really, really important because they support post-fire ecosystem function and resilience and also act as um, biodiversity um, hotspots post-fire. Now, as pointed out by Meddens um, in their cool paper uh, of a few years ago now, uh, fire refugia occur at a variety of different scales, um, from you know, the metres squared um, all the way up to hundreds of hectares. The scale that we're particularly interested in, and we're tentatively calling fire micro refugia, are these ones at the, the metre squared scale or maybe small patches of vegetation. And these are the ones that are, are likely to be really important for small organisms like invertebrates or annual plants. So how might all this work in practice? So I'm going to take you to my favourite national park in the whole world, um, Mount Kaputar National Park a high altitude plateau in northern New South Wales, which among other things supports um, this um, subalpine or high altitude uh, 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 eucalypt forest. Now, the other really cool thing in, in that eucalypt forest is this endangered snail and slug community. There's a whole range of really interesting snails, but the amazing component is the, are these hot pink slugs, which get up to 20 centimetres in length. Now, um, it's an endangered ec ecological community, and like many other land mollusk um, species and communities, 
it's very threatened by fire. And indeed, fire does occur in these in these systems. Uh, this was the um, impact of the Black Summer fires, um, at right at the start of the Black Summer fires. And this area of slug habitat burnt during those fires. Happily, there was some natural uh, refugia through here. These rocks um, sort of broke up fuel loads and meant that there were little bits that didn't burn and others that were quite patchy in their burns. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, here's photographs of uh, a broader part of the community. Um, so how might we actually go about protecting uh, this slug and snail community in this sort of scenario? Well, if we look around the, the local plant community, we can actually see some nature-based solutions. So this species here in the understory, this shrub is Caprosma hotella. Now we haven't yet burnt this species on the barbecue, but we've burnt lots of Caprosmas um, here in New Zealand, and they're all quite low in flammability. So what this raises then is the possibility that we could take a more interventionist approach in this ecosystem and plant out this native plant um, in these more fire prone areas to provide at least some protection um, for the um, uh, snail and slug community and other invertebrates. It may not work in all fires, um, but it's certainly worth testing to see um, whether this is a possible way to produce fire micro refugia. So in summary, green fire break should be part of the toolkit for fire mitigation and biodiversity conservation. Plants used for crops, pastures, mahinga kai and medicine um, include species that are low in flammability. So they could be used for reconfiguring um, agricultural landscapes. And where needed, we would argue that native species could be planted to create fire micro refugia for small organisms like snails and slugs. Now, because I'm a dad and I get to make dad jokes, are there any burning questions? Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tim. Great presentation. Um, I'll give you a sec to jump on live. I think I've got a question. Is that a hand up, Zach Steele? No, oh, sorry, there was a, something flashed up on my screen. So I've got, I've got one quick question for you, Tim. Um, yeah, thanks, Lee. You're looking at the low, you know, low flammability food crops and assessing them you know, primarily based on their, the flammability of those species um, and perhaps their ability to suppress fires. But I was just wondering about their, those species' resistance to fire as well, because some of those species, even though they're um, low flammability, when they burn, you know, they might die. So is there a benefit in having species that are, are low flammability, but also, you know, survive the fire themselves? Yeah, uh, look, great question. Uh, there absolutely is. And uh, we've been doing work here. I had a PhD student looking at uh, fire post-fire responses of uh, native plants following our, our big fires in the Port Hills here near Christchurch. And so we're starting to fill the huge gap in the literature here in New Zealand in terms of how species respond to fire. And for us, one of the um, sort of sweet spots with green firebreak species is species that are able to both uh, put out a fire, but then also uh, resprout and recover following that fire um, so you don't have to replant them after after one burn. So they, they sort of um, self-perpetuate and recover. So there are some species that do that, not all of them. Um, thankfully, a lot of the traits that make species likely to uh, resist a fire are also ones that enable them to grow fast after after a, um, a disturbance, um, but that's assuming they can survive the fire in the first place. Yeah, okay, cool. Time for one more really quick question, if anyone has one from our speakers. That's right, we're gonna have um, plenty of time in the fire circle and, and the other parts that team I've got hundred other questions for you and I'm sure most of the audience does as well. Um, in particular, I really like the term green fire break summer salad. I'd like to talk more about that. <laughs> thanks, for so, sure. Thanks again. Thanks again for your presentation and talk soon. Thanks, Luke. So uh, our next speaker is, is Gabrielle Weizrame. And um, again, it's a real pleasure to have you today here today, Gabrielle. Gabrielle is a um, assistant research professor 
at the Desert Research Institute in the United States. Um, I was really amazed actually when I first read Gabrielle's work on restoring wildfire and managed wildfire. And I remember as soon as I read that, her, one of her first papers, I sent it to a, a whole bunch of fire managers in Australia and said, we should do this. Um, and it's, it's it, lots of good ideas here. So Gabrielle, I'm really looking forward to your presentation today. Thanks. Hello, my name is Gabrielle Boirame. I'm an assistant research professor at DRI, Nevada's Desert Research Institute. I'll be talking about work I've done on how restoring wildfire in a Sierra Nevada watershed has led to increased land cover heterogeneity. First, I'm going to discuss a bit about fire history in the Sierra Nevadas and specifically introduce Illilouette Creek Basin, our study site talk about mapping vegetation changes and translating those to landscape metrics, looking at potential future trajectories of this landscape under fire, um, and lastly, uh, talk a bit about relating vegetation to soil moisture. So in dry Western US forests, such as the Sierra Nevadas, historically, there were more frequent, smaller, more mixed severity fires than we see today. Um, in this graph that's adapted from some work by Scott Stevens, you can see that prior to 1800, the number of hectares that were burned per year um, was vastly greater than what was burned during the second half of the 1900s. And all of this fire suppression allowed um, fuels to build up, forests to become denser, and completely change the landscape, both pre-fire and post-fire, because pre-fire you have much denser forest cover. And then when you have these really big, extensive, high severity fires that happen because of the fuel buildup, then that creates post-fire landscapes that are more homogeneous um, because you've removed all of the forest cover over a very large area compared to what you might have seen in the mixed severity fires that happened before when fires happened more often and there was less fuel buildup. Alilouette Creek Basin is located in Yosemite National Park. And this is a really unique place because although it was fire suppressed, much like pretty much everywhere else in the Western US, in the 1970s, land managers chose to allow naturally ignited wildfires to burn in this landscape. And so there have now been dozens of fires over the last 50 years and they have burned in sort of this jigsaw puzzle. You can see in this animation, new fires generally um, don't burn over other fires that happened very recently. And so this creates this real patchwork on the landscape because you have different places burning at different times. Um, you don't get huge high severity over large extents because the fires are self-limiting and this jigsaw puzzle of fires then leads to a mosaic of landscape change. Once again, here are all, all the fires that have happened since 1972. More recent ones are in solid colors, um, just so you can see them more easily. And now here we have the changes in land cover that happened as results of those fires. So these maps were created using historical aerial imagery from 1969 and 1970 all the way up to 2012. And this imagery was digitized into a few broad land categories, um, rock and water, conifer forest, shrub dominated areas, sparse grasslands, dense grasslands, which includes wetlands and aspen groves. And you can see that it starts out um, fairly homogeneous. It's mostly forest cover over all of the watershed that isn't rock or open water. And then over time, as more and more fires come through, it becomes a lot more diverse, a lot more heterogeneous. Um, we have more areas that are open grasslands, some large aspen groves come in. Um, and we have more shrub fields as well. And here you can see the overall transitions 
about 55% um, of the watershed was conifer and then stayed conifer. Um, and you can see the dense meadows more than doubled in size over time, thanks to these fires and sparse meadows also increased by a large amount. And here's a close up of what that looks like in one area. You can see you have really dense forest back in 1969 because of that century of fire suppression. And then by 2012, you have this great mosaic on the landscape where you still have some mature forest, mixed conifers of different ages. Um, you've also got aspen, dense meadows, sparse meadows, and some expanding shrublands. These changes in broad overstory categories can also affect the understory plant diversity. Um, as you can see from these pictures in general, um, there's lower vegetation cover on, in the conifer forest areas compared to the meadow open areas. And you also have increased richness on average in the um, understory vegetation species in the meadows, especially the dense meadows. Um, although we didn't have a large enough sample size to be able to tell if this is a statistically significant increase in species richness. We also looked at landscape metrics of this changing vegetation and the evenness index, which is measurement of heterogeneity. It has been steadily increasing since 1970. Here we have two different versions of the evenness index and you see they're both increasing. Um, and then the aggregation index is another way to measure where you have, it's higher aggregation index, then it's more uniform. And so that decreasing is also an indicator of greater heterogeneity in the landscape. And you can see both of these seem to be continuing on their trajectories over time. They're not really leveling out. And so we think there's still more change that is likely to happen in this watershed if the fires keep happening at similar intervals to what they have been doing. Some other metrics that we looked at, um, the percent area of the largest patches. You can see the conifer patches have been de decreasing, size of patches of all other vegetation types have been increasing. The fractal dimension of patches has also been increasing for all vegetation types, which basically means how complex the shapes are. Um, and so if you have you know, just one large patch where the edge isn't very varied, then that would have a very low fractal dimension. And so higher fractal dimension probably means you have a lot more border between different patches, which means more variety um, of habitat. And on the bottom, you just have the fire history. Um, to give some context, the vertical lines that reach all the way from bottom to top are the years in which we had that aerial imagery. And then the thicker black bars are area burned in those different years. Um, Octavia Crompton has also been doing some work with these maps. And she created a dynamic succession model to look at vegetation change and how it was likely to continue into the future with more burning. And so the calibration ensemble is basically vegetation change calibrated to the actual changes that we have observed. And if you continue at similar fire return interval, you expect the forest fraction to keep decreasing, maybe start leveling off a little bit, um, somewhere between 50 and 60% forest cover. Um, but if you decrease the return interval, in other words, making the fires occur more often, then of course you're going to decrease that fraction that is forested. Um, same thing if you increase the severity of the fires, which you see in panel B, you expect to decrease the forest fraction more. Um, that's something that might happen under climate change if we have more extreme fire weather. 
um, though you can see that the severity is not quite as important as the return interval in terms of reducing that forest cover over the long term. Um, another interesting thing is that if you, if this watershed was to be 10% drier, um, like some watersheds that are further south in the Sierra Nevadas, or as the watershed may transition to under a future climate, then you do not get as much of a change in the vegetation um, due to the fires um, because you get a less productive site and the fuels do not burn as readily and so you don't get as much change. Another thing we did that was interesting with the vegetation maps was we took manual soil moisture measurements throughout the watershed under different types of vegetation cover. And we related vegetation and topography to soil moisture to create a statistical model. And unsurprisingly, we saw that in um, wet meadows, we had much higher moisture on average. Places that were meadow and had um, been meadow since 1970 had the highest mean um, soil water content at 40% water. Places that had transitioned from conifer to meadow had the second highest water content. Um, the driest places were sparse meadows that um, were post-fire landscapes and shrubs and conifers were pretty equal on average. But we used all of these data, um, as I said, in a statistical model to try and upscale our measurements to the entire watershed. And so this is a map of estimated soil water content or volumetric water content, VWC, over the entire watershed. And so you can see mostly fairly dry, um, less than 10% water, but a few areas um, where some of the meadows are you can see much higher water content in the model. Um, and then we ran the model under two scenarios, one which is burned, so with the actual vegetation that we see on the landscape today, and then also an unburned scenario in which you imagine there hadn't been any fires and the vegetation cover had stayed the same as it was back in 1970. And all the places in blue are places where we expect that August soil moisture would, um, is higher today than it would have been in an unburned scenario. Um, and places in brown are places where it is drier today than it would have been if there had not been any fires on this landscape. And so you can see there's some variation, um, but basically we've increased the variation, not just in the vegetation cover, but also variation in the soil water content. Um, and we've created some large patches of places that are much wetter than we expect that they would be if these fires hadn't come through and opened up the landscape, um, removing some vegetation in those areas and transitioning them to wet meadows. So the restored fire regime has greatly increased heterogeneity by decreasing forest cover, increasing the cover of meadows and shrublands. This um, can be really important for having a diversity of um, habitats for different flora and fauna, of course. And we expect that the forested fraction will likely continue decreasing into the future if frequent fires continue, although this effect might be lessened if the landscape gets a lot drier and less productive. This decreased forest cover has likely increased understory richness, which helps, again, increase the diversity of vegetation that we have on this landscape, which is, again, more of a diversity of habitat. And under the current burned landscape, we have more varied soil moisture than we expect there would be if fires had not come through. And this can create hydrologic refugia um, where you can increase drought resistance because you have more moisture that is able to be retained longer into the summer and help plants survive even under really dry conditions. I'd like to thank the Park Service for um, 
creating this amazing place that is the Lillooet Creek Basin by doing this experiment with allowing natural fire back onto the landscape. Thank my sponsors, many field and research assistants who helped take measurements and um, do some of the mapping, and my co-authors. Thank you. And are there any questions? Thanks so much, Gabrielle. Great presentation. Um, I'm going to start you off with a quick question. Um, well, it might not be so quick, but um, you, you did some modeling on you know future climate and, and how some of these scenarios might play out. I was just wondering, just thinking big, pet, big picture across the, the Western United States, whether you think the conditions, whether which you know, managed fire regimes or restored wildfire, um, the conditions under which that idea can be implemented um, are getting so extreme that it's going to be hard to do in many landscapes. Yeah, that's definitely a big issue. It might be that um, a little wet creek basin sort of they started burning it in this sweet spot of time when fire weather wasn't that extreme yet. And even though the forests had get a lot, gotten a lot denser and fuels had built up a lot, um, returning fire to the landscape seemed to bring it back to a natural fire return interval pretty quickly um, without causing any huge high severity patches. Um, and there is a lot of question about whether it's sort of too late to do the same sort of thing as was done in the Alilouette and a lot of other places um, without a lot more intervention because now you do have a lot more extreme fire weather. Um, but there are places, but hopefully it could still happen um, with some you know, careful management, maybe not allowing fires to burn when conditions are too extreme, um, but still um, making sure to let those fires burn um, whenever it is reasonably safe to do so. Um, or some places may need to sort of be kick-started with um, some prescribed burning um, or some careful, uh, really ecologically friendly thinning um, to sort of get this resilient landscape pattern started um, that hopefully would then be sustainable into the future. Um, but yeah, that is something that I've wondered about a lot is, you know, is it too late climate wise for a lot of places to return to a natural fire regime um, as well as the little what seems to have. Great, it's, it's fascinating stuff. I guess a, a counter argument to what I was sort of saying might be that it's actually more important than ever to have this approach um, given the extremes and, and the buffers that it, it could offer in, in some context. Anyway. Yeah, def definitely um, very important. Um, yeah, I'm not saying we should just give up on this idea, um, just that it might take um, some a more active involved approach um, than was done with the Alilouette, um, not that there hasn't been any management there, um, but just may have to be done even more carefully. Um, and maybe with some more direct interventions um, to get landscapes sort of in that area of not, not too many fuels um, to the point where the fires can be naturally self-limiting. Yep. Great. Do we have a, a quick question from the, the audience of speakers? So uh, uh, this is this is Pepe Iniguez. I, I I I didn't have a question, but I kind of wanted to add a comment to that idea whether it's too late to use managed fire. And I think that that's that's kind of um, you know in 2009 there was some some uh, changes to the policies in the U.S. to allow managers to kind of uh, to 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 apply this this idea of managed fire, and we're doing a study right now, and it, and it seems like the, the we have we are seeing more more um, of these managed fires, but the so we're we're seeing more numbers of them, but the, the area burned by them is not is not increasing as as, as uh, I think we would hope. So I think that you know it took it takes some legislation, and then the other big big limiting factor is actually smoke because no matter what kind of fire it is, you're going to be putting up smoke, and and people just just don't like smoke. So I think it's a, it's a, there's a social component that people have to kind of be more. Uh, um, 
um, I guess uh, somehow we got to convince the public to to allow these managed fires. But but smoke is definitely a limiting factor in all this. Yeah, that's a very good point because um, it's you know a lot of people get upset when they see especially a national park burning um, if they don't realize that fire is a natural part of the landscape. And actually this summer, there were multiple lightning ignitions within Lillooet Creek Basin, um, the watershed I just talked about, um, that were suppressed using minimally invasive techniques because it is the wilderness. Um, but it was just such a hot, dry summer in California. Um, there'd been so much drought over the last couple of years um, that the managers, the managers decided that they couldn't risk allowing fire to burn on the landscape. So even Lillooet, which is this you know, great example um, of a fairly natural fire regime this year, they decided it was too risky to let it burn. Um, but hopefully um, we'll be able to find ways to keep using fire on the landscape uh, to keep a more natural system and more resilient to those future fires. Great. Thanks again, Gabrielle. And you've got, I'll let you follow up. There's a couple of questions that popped up on the app that I'll let you answer there. Thanks for the question, Jose. Good to hear from you and, and see you again after seeing you in Arizona. All right, uh, thank you. And, um, okay, so our next speaker and the, the final speaker of the first session here is, is Christopher Dickman. Um, Professor Dickman is uh, an ecologist at Sydney University. It's a real honor to introduce him today. He's had a big influence on the kind of ecology that I do in arid and, and semi-arid Australia. And his work is a great example of, of world-class, you know, long-term long ecological experiments and, and long-term field experiments as well. So welcome, Chris. I'll leave it to the, your pre-recorded presentation and then we'll, we'll talk after that. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Dickman. I'll be speaking on behalf of my collaborators, Aaron Greenville and Glenn Wardle. On, uh, on the topic of uh, effects of fire in the desert on lizard populations. So I'll begin by sharing the screen. So the focus is gonna be on desert lizard populations. Fires do occur in deserts, and in fact, they occur in the central Australian deserts big time, as we will see. The area that I'll be talking about is the spinifex grassland that occurs over about a quarter of the continental land area of Australia. And I'll be delving down particularly into the interaction between fire and predators and the joint effects, the interactive effects of these processes on lizard populations and communities. And then I'll look at the possibility of providing artificial refuges for lizards and for other vertebrates uh, or safe house structures to, uh, to conserve them into the, into the future. So a little bit of background first of all, Arid Australia is something like 70% of the continent. The landscapes tend to be low, they're reasonably well intact, but they're also subject to some fairly high climatic extremes, which makes the very high biodiversity of a wide range of different vertebrates and plants um, all the more surprising. In fact, the Australian deserts are the most highly diverse areas for lizards of any arid regions in the world. And there are other groups like the insectivorous marsupials that are incredibly diverse there too. So the area that I'll be talking about is shown by the red star in the summer rainfall dominated area of central Australia. Simpson Desert itself is a particularly tough desert in some ways. It's dominated by long red sand dunes, as you can see in the top right figure, they cover something like 70% of the, of the desert, and it's spinifex or hummock grassland, a spiky type of uh, porcupine grass. The climate is quite variable. Temperatures range from anywhere from minus seven to over 50 degrees C, and rainfall also can be variable, and it can catch you out if you're, uh, if you're not too aware, as shown in the bottom right figure. Um, that was uh, the result of a rainfall event some years ago. Lizards of the Simpson Desert are really quite diverse. There are 54 skink species, a range of geckos, dragons, 
uh, varanid species and pygopodids or flat footed lizards. Some of these are shown here. This is the Parenti in the top left. It's the world's second largest lizard after the Komodo dragon. Um, there's a range of skinks such as these little guys here, panther skinks, blue tongue skinks, the fawny devil here, and a gecko in the top right. So it's a very diverse area for lizard fauna. The desert is characterized by wild swings in rainfall that often lead to wildfire events. So over the last century, if we look at the main rainfall patterns, these are two stations, Marion Downs and Glen Ormiston, on the edge of the Simpson Desert. The rainfall trace is shown in the pink and the purple, and you can see that after every rainfall, annual rainfall spike here in 1915-1916, a fire followed the following year. Similar sort of event, big rains in 1950-51, fires took place in 1951, and again in 1974, and 2001. So big rainfalls lead to a, an increase in the productivity of spin effects, as well as annual plants. These dry off the following year and are then subject to lightning strikes that set off very widespread conflagrations of the desert. So it's a particular and peculiar feature of the, uh, the Australian arid zone, particularly areas dominated by this one grass spin effects. So in 2001, 2002, a large wildfire burnt much of the study region that I'll be talking about. It burnt uh, around 2,500 square kilometers of our 8,000 square kilometer study area. Another wildfire burnt almost the same area in 2011, 2012. In both events, in both, uh, both fire seasons, around 30,000 or more square kilometers burnt elsewhere in Arab Australia. In the particular study region I'm talking about, the fire return interval, mean, re mean return interval, is around 26 years. So here is a plot showing the, uh, the main properties on which we work. If you look at Carlo and Craven's Peak, the grey here shows the extent of the fire in 2001-2002. The effects of fire can be quite dramatic. If you look at, uh, this is a control burn down the bottom where you can see the spin effects has been burnt. There's still ash at the base. Over large areas though, when a wildfire goes through, there's virtually nothing left. If you look at the top right figure with the car coming through the, uh, the red sand dunes, there's virtually nothing. Um, some, uh, some shrubs here that uh, managed to, uh, to re-sprout in the months after the fire, but otherwise, cover of vegetation has gone. And it leaves patches like this, fragments in the, in the middle top here of uh, a vegetation that managed to escape the fire because they're in the lee side of a sand dune or the change of the wind, um, fragments of, of spinifex habitat that are littered throughout the desert in the wake of a large fire. So what are the effects of these fires on the, on the lizard fauna? To find out, we sampled using pitfall traps pitfall shown in the top right. Fence crosses the pitfall trap, and you can see in the bottom, bottom right here. Large, we set large numbers of pitfall traps, 81 hectare grids, each grid containing 36 traps. In the fires that burnt in 2001-2002, we had um, something like 31 burnt grids and 49 that, uh, that were unburnt, providing a really nice comparison between the, uh, the burnt and the unburnt sites. Lots of lizard captures over that period. So I'll show some patterns of the effects of that fire on lizard populations in just a moment. In, in the wake of um, the fires, we've also set up some additional grids and patches that have remained unburnt to look at the effect of the fire on the fragmentation of the spinifex habitat. On lizard populations. We sampled a range of other things as well, vegetation and invertebrate food resources at the same time. So what were the effects? On well, spin effects, first of all, so this is the 2001-2002 fires. The data are broken in this slide and then the subsequent ones into the effects of uh, spin effects on um, burnt areas here shown in the, the dark line, dark symbols and the unburned sites shown here, broken line and the open symbols. And it's pretty clear that 
prior to the fire, Spinifex cover was around 35%. Immediately after the fire, burnt Spinifex cover ranged from about 1% to 5% or less in virtually all areas. It didn't rain over this long period, so there was no chance of regeneration. In the unburnt areas, by contrast, Spinifex cover remained over the entire period, despite the, uh, the subsequent drought post-wildfire, the populations um, of the Spinifex cover remained reasonably intact. Lizards responded in a variety of ways. Mostly, though, they tended to decline. This is lizard abundance. Here's the wildfire. Prior to the wildfire, not much difference in overall lizard abundance. Immediately after the fire, or the year after, lizard populations pretty much crashed to zero. They peaked again here and seem to recover in subsequent years. But in comparison with the unburnt sites, the, there was a big crash in the, in the lizard populations on the burnt sites as compared with the unburnt. Not as big an effect as you might expect, and we'll see why in just a moment. If you look at lizard richness, there's a fairly dramatic effect. Again, lizard richness declines, declines to pretty much zero in the year after the wildfire, recovers a little bit, but in terms of numbers of species per plot, they were always less over the five years post-fire as compared to the unburned sites. Some of the individual species responses, this is one of the common military dragons, um, tended to be to suppressed in low numbers for the most part after the fire, but recovered fairly well in the unburned sites. Similar pattern for the panther skink, crashed pretty much zero for many years after the, after the wildfire had gone through, but recovered fairly well with seasonal fluctuations, as you might expect, not much activity in winter, peaking in the, in the spring and summer periods in the, in the unburned sites. Similar pattern again for another of the striped to notice species. Now this one to notice ducks did very well in the unburned sites, but very poorly in the burnt ones. Other species showed very little response. This one, for example, the southern sand slider, Larista labialis, it, uh, it did quite well in the burnt and the unburnt areas. It's semi-fossorial, it feeds on termites, probably wasn't as affected as the other species. And then the uh, species that did well in the burnt areas, these dragons, uh, central native dragons, really prefer open burnt areas. And that tends to account for the, um, the recovery in abundance, overall lizard abundance uh, that we saw just now. In the sites that were fragmented in 2002, soon after the wildfire had gone through, these are the, this is a plot of species richness against log area. This is the 2002 results show, as you might expect, an increase in richness with area. Four years later, there was again an increase in richness with area, but there'd been a marked relaxation effect in the small um, fragmented areas of spinifex. Most of the species that had occurred originally in the small patches had disappeared. So the slopes of the lines are quite different. But what are some of the processes that drive the losses of lizards? We looked at a whole range. We, uh, we did observations, made experiments, to uncover what was going on. And the only one that came out as being really plausible was the effect of predation and the predation and cover interaction. That's what I want to focus on uh, for the next few slides and how we can mitigate this interaction. So predation on lizards, there's a range of predators out there. These are mammalian predators, the Mulgara, a native marsupial predator, other smaller marsupial predators, the red fox, the cat, and the sand goanna. These are the frequency, uh, percentage frequency of occurrence data of lizards in the predator diets. Pre-fire here, in, these were all unburnt, then three to 12 months post-fire in unburnt habitat. Not much change in any of the, the diet data, but three to 12 months post-fire in the areas that were burnt, you can see that there are two results. Dramatic increases in the percent frequency of occurrence of lizards in the diet of the red fox, and particularly in the diet of the feral cat. 
using lizard models, we found that the attack rates on lizards were around seven and a half fold greater in burnt compared to unburnt um, or covered spinifex habitat. And in this case, we found that birds and marsupial predators were dominant. Some examples of the, uh, the kind of uh, predatory attacks on the models are shown here. So to try to work out if we could introduce safe houses to engender lizard recovery, we initially set up some areas with, uh, with wire mesh fencing, fence controls where the fencing was provided, but it was not dug into the sand and open areas and use giving up density trials. These are means of locally enriching patch with, uh, with a food source that will target animals likely to, uh, to enjoy eating. And then you come back after a, uh, after a foraging bout and find out how much of the food is gone. If much has gone, then you can be reasonably, uh, reasonably assured that the animals felt uh, uh, sufficiently risk-free to spend enough time there to find the food and dig it out. If most of the food is left, by contrast, that is the giving up density is high, then presumably there were constraints, predation risk perhaps, as being the, the consequence or the cause of that result. So we set out 10 mealworms for, uh, for geckos at night, 10 mealworms per plot by day for skinks and dragons. This is what the plots look like. They're simply um, plots of uh, wire mesh that were dug into the sand to preclude access by avian predators and particularly by foxes and cats. The results, these are the giving up density results for geckos in the left column here, skinks and dragons here. If you look at the unburned results first, the giving up density results are really little different between the different treatments, the exclusion fence, the fence control and the open control. And the same here for, uh, for skinks and dragons. The giving up densities were between two and four in general. In the burnt habitat, by contrast, if we look for geckos first of all, giving up density was comparably low only where predators were excluded. In the fence controls or in the open, the giving up densities were high. Same results or very similar results for skinks and dragons. Low giving up density under the artificial refuges, the safe houses, but in the open, under the fence controls and in the open controls, high giving up densities suggesting that the animals were aware of the risk of predation that was posed by being in the open rather than under a, a safe house structure. In terms of population recovery, this is a plot uh, after the 2011 fire of putting up um, structures like this uh, to provide safe houses. The results, looking at uh, the effects of control, fence control and real fence um, exclusion plots for predators. These results reflect the numbers of one species, just for illustration, this species here, the military dragon, one year after fire, three years, and then five years after fire. And what you can see fairly clearly, I think, is that immediately after fire, numbers of dragons were pretty low in all treatment areas, but three years, particularly five years post fire, the dragon populations had recovered very well but only in the areas where they had access to safe houses. Rain is very important in the longer term. Um, you don't get recovery without the recovery of vegetation. So after heavy rains in 2007 and later in 2010, these are the numbers of lizards, 100, uh, 100 trap nights, and you can see increases after the heavy rains as compared with the period after the wildfire, which was largely in drought. For the longer term, climate change is likely to lead to increased temperatures over much of arid Australia and less rainfall over large areas. The consequences in general will be more intense broad scale fires. And if, as we've seen, the interaction between these kinds of fires and predation is maintained, populations of many lizards are likely to fare very poorly. So just to wrap up, wildfire clearly is a major process that drives structural change in the spinifex grasslands in Central Australia. Lizards, as well as a wide variety of other vertebrates, respond to the fire, usually quite negatively, 
but not so much to the fire itself, but rather to the fire predation interaction. It's really that interaction that drives the declines in populations and species richness of lizards and of other species that, um, that I haven't shown. But it's possible that safe houses, the erection of artificial refuges, can provide a way to mitigate these effects. If we fi can find a way to do this at scale, we may have an opportunity to safeguard populations over the longer term. This has been a, a long-term, multi-faceted um, investigation. Many people to thank, including Luke and uh, the Association for Fire Ecology for this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, fascinating talk. I'm sure a few questions are going to come in on the app soon. Um, I'll start you off with a question, and we have a little bit of time. This is the, the last um, presentation of the session today. Um, just thinking about you know rolling this out in, in different locations, wh where do you think this approach will be most effective? Like what, what kind of context in particular? I think in a couple of contexts, one where you've got almost complete removal of vegetation from the from the ground surface so there's no cover for any of the, uh, the small vertebrates that lived there before but secondly in areas where there are particularly at risk species small populations of threatened species where you could roll out safe houses these sort of artificial refuges um, at scale that would be meaningful for the populations that you try to protect so i think those yep. two areas would be uh, would be critical yeah, I was, I, was, I was thinking that perhaps in small fragments as well, so a lot of urban fragments in, in, in you know, places like Melbourne, Sydney, I'm sure in lots of other parts of the world too, they, they're not getting enough fire because it's hard to, to burn those little areas all at once because it does remove habitat for species. So this could be a nice option for, for you know, using fire in urban areas as well if, if that fire removes vegetation to, to put things in. Yeah, it could indeed. It's really a vegetation replacement method. Yeah. It's kind of similar to uh, Tim's um, talk where he mentioned uh, microrefugia, where you're looking at uh, more fire resistant plants, perhaps. But here we're looking at um, artificial structures that can be put in temporarily and then uh, then removed once the surrounding vegetation has come back and uh, you've, uh, you've achieved the protection that's needed to maintain the populations of lizards or small mammals or other species, small birds. Great. Uh so people who are in the room are open to ask questions via Zoom, if you like. And this is Tanya chiming in. I just want to give a couple of announcements as folks drop any last minute questions into the chat or the Q&A. Um, but I want to thank everyone for joining us today and let you all know that the session will be available in Whova, our conference app, within a couple weeks after the Congress ends. Uh, we hope you stick around tonight for a couple of great networking opportunities, um, starting with uh, from 6.30 to 7 Eastern time. We are hosting a networking session for first time Congress attendees with a welcome in Q&A. And from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time, we encourage you all to visit our exhibitor booths to connect with our Congress sponsors and partners. Um, to meet with our sponsors and browse their virtual booth content, you can click the exhibitors tab in the navigation bar in Whova. Um, and also, as a reminder, we do have a passport contest going on. So you can earn stamps by visiting exhibitor booths and liking, commenting, or participating in deals and offers. Attendees with the most stamps will be entered into a drawing to win a free Fire Congress registration for 2023. And I'll let you, uh, Luke, get to any last minute questions um, that our attendees might have today. Thanks very much, Tanya. Hi, um, Luke, I have a question if possible. Yep, shoot. Thanks. Hi, Chris, a really interesting talk. Thanks for that. Um, I was just wondering, um, I don't think you mentioned this because I think you were just talking about reptiles, but do you know if there's any work that's going on on the use of safe houses for mammals? And um, if you also think it would be appropriate for uh, looking after small mammals. Thank you. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, in fact, this is the first talk I've uh, I've given uh, looking at the results for some of the reptiles. 
Um, in fact, the work was primarily stimulated by, um, by our desire to try to work out a method for conserving mammals. Um, so it does work for mammals very mm. well. Um, it's worked certainly in our desert system and where the technique has been employed, it's been used in the forest environments in Victoria. Um, it's being used in the post fire in the, in the Sydney, um, large Sydney reserve. Um, and mammals have been the primary beneficiaries of the, of the safe houses. And there's evidence in some studies too, including our desert system, where um, small birds, small ground dwelling birds like quails, are also benefiting from these, uh, these structures. Yeah, fantastic. Good to know. Thanks. And any other questions from the audience? Cool. We've got lots of time to discuss these. We've got a, another session coming same time tomorrow um, with, with five new speakers. And, um, and then we're going to have the, the fire circle in, in two days time, which for some of us will be Thursday, some of us Friday. Um, well, I'm sure some of the Americans as well are starting to get into the evening for you. So we might, we might wind things up and let you go and, and get some dinner and whatnot. And the Australians maybe a late breakfast and, and a few others, it's, it's getting very late. But I just want to say thanks for all the speakers today, uh, Sophie, Tim, Gabrielle and Chris. I think it's really, you know, exciting work and, and putting these ideas together, I think is really, is really fascinating. So look forward to just chatting about this over the next few days. And thanks again, everyone. And thanks to all the, the audience for, for watching this today. Thanks, Luke. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.